thank you. And there are indeed seats up here. Um, so I'm Lewis. Oh, I think this works better. I'm Lewis, and I'm presenting work that I did um, most mostly when I was at the um, at, at the MBL with Per Borg's group. Uh, although I've now moved to China, so to start my own group. So, and I already saw some people taking pictures of slides. So, you know, why don't you just take pic one picture of this one, and you get all the slides online? And that's because uh, they're all. Actually, I'm even presenting from this public URL. Uh, I'm even going to refresh so I make sure I have the, li the latest version. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, mind. I don't really have an introduction because I figure that you, you can just pretend that I said exactly the same things that Devin and Alex said at the beginning of at the beginning of their talks, um, and what we're trying to do uh, is get an Eierlegen and Vollmisch Zau. Okay, and and here our research question was: Okay, if we are willing to sacrifice generality and focus just on bioinformatics and focus just on the kind of problems that we are interested in, um, can we get a better tool? Can we dis and by using a domain-specific language? So, in you've uh, in the previous talk we already saw this mention of the Nextflow domain-specific language, which which is very powerful, can do a lot of things. So. Here the trade-off is, can we be less powerful but do those few things better? And what does it mean to be better? So the number one thing, it, you know, we want to have correct science. Um, we want usability, reproducibility. We want things to be understandable. Uh, we want to support best practices because, um, you know, and again, com going back to the previous talks, you know, there's a lot of documents out there saying this is, this is what you should do. This is, um, and nobody, will actually disagree with you that that's the best practice, but that doesn't mean that people actually do it. Because, so we want to lower the activation energy to do that. And finally, we also want to, the tool to be fast. Um, okay, so this is, the, this is sort of the um, Eierling and the Vollmisch Zau slide. So you know, on the one hand, you know, usability, even usability, does, we want things that work out of the box. You know, Bioconda install, run pipeline with single command or a single click, uh, and that even people who are experts in their, you know, their biological problem, they should be able to use it. We also want things to be really flexible and customizable and be able to tweak it to our own very specific problem, which nobody else in the world has, because I, my problem is special. And we, and we, we um, you know, people, people who are not afraid of the Unix command line, they also want to be able to tweak. And so, so even the word usability, you know, you're already pulling stuff apart. And, there's, uh, and in science, we also, projects last, can last a long time. We want things to be reproducible. We want to now be able to reproduce a project that was published a couple of years ago that maybe had data from, from a while back. Um, and at the same time, things move. What, what we were doing, you know, maybe there's new methods out. There's stuff moves fast. So, so our solution, uh, this is what I'm proposing, is this. Uh, domain-specific programming language called NGLess, and so here, and actually, this is this is a complete script. Uh, so uh, we don't need to go through the whole thing. I'll just point out a couple of things. So so here at the at the top, we so you declare everything's version. So you declare version. Uh, so we just released version 1.0. Uh, so we actually had a talk yesterday encouraged us to call things 1.0. Uh, and we, we synchronized it, so the publication came out last month, and as we knew the paper was going to come out, we said, okay, this is version 1.0. But then we, all, all, everything else, and there's a couple of modules that you can introduce that these add, these come, these add things like uh, novel functionality, novel, novel data sets that are integrated, and you also version that. And then everything, you know, it kind of looks very Python-esque. We also stole some ideas from Ruby. Uh, and you know, here you basically you're loading some some samples, some set of fastq files, doing some pre-processing, then mapping, and you know, then doing some summarization analysis. The free, the most frequently asked question is why are we doing this? You know, if we wanted to have something that looks like Python-esque, we could have just used Python and developed a library in Python that um, that basically did this, or there's other projects for workflows already out there. Um, and so 
I'm going to try to spend the next 12 minutes trying to, trying to show you the advantages of this approach. So, there's three, uh, so this was maybe twice as much effort as that would have been, and, but I'm going to show that, okay, at least this is what we get out of it. So, so, uh, so just as a programming language, so, um, so this is a very standard imperative style programming language. You read it from top to bottom. Um, everything is statically typed, uh, so the types are, can all be inferred. And as I said, it has very limited functionality. You know, if you wanna get technical, it's not Turing complete. You cannot define your own, um, your own uh, it's, you're limited in what you can do. You, you can only really do that, do the stuff. You can only do, really do stuff related to bioinformatics. But it is adapted to bioinformatics, so things like short reads, et cetera, um, some files, they're all concepts that the tool itself knows about. And so what are, the, what are the big advantages of this? So one of the things, and this, we actually spend a lot of time with this, is that there's a lot of tools that work really well, but fail really badly. That means that if you give the tool everything it sort of needs and wants, then you get your results very fast, good results. But if something's wrong, you know, then, then you get some sort of error happened, you know, core dump. And so, so actually I don't have a, pro I've, and I've tried Google Scholar to find one to get a proper citation for this claim that most time that you spend on software development is debugging. But I think if you've written more than one single line of bash, you know, this is like getting a citation for water is wet. I mean, yes, you sp we spend most of our time trying to figure out why stuff is going wrong. And so, you know, it's like, it's like when you're optimizing software. You want to, you want to optimize what, where do we spend, where does software spend the most time? Cut that down. Where do people spend the most time? Let's try to cut that down. Uh, so, you know, we do, we, you know, bad error messages, we treat them as bugs. That's actually, um, and actually, please report them. Uh, I think there's sometimes a bit of a feeling of, oh, I, I'm, it's like, as a user, if you, if you get core dump, that's like a bug in the software. Um, you know, you should report that. If there's, a, if there's an issue, the software should tell you what the issue is. If it's run out of memory, it should say, I've run out of memory. If your file is misformatted, it should say line 317, that's an error. So please report, please report that error uh, as bugs. Uh, you know, we, we try to fail clearly. Uh, so this, this, is a, an, a, this is actually a, um, if you don't know it, this is a parody account. Uh, but obviously the joke is that this happens way too often. Um, and, and, and actually one of the things that often happens in many tools is you, you, so you have, so the tool starts writing its output and then you know, somehow something goes wrong and then you have a half finished file. So that's the type of thing that we, we don't do. So we try to, so we tr and this is really enabled by the fact that the language is very limited. So a lot of the things can, a lot of things can be done to infer what the user really wanted to, to do, uh, as opposed to, you know, if you're trying to do this where, where you're dealing with, say, a bash script, it's impossible to control all of the possible things that can go wrong. Uh, and another, for example, one thing that we can check is, you know, do the input files exist? And, you know, do the output directories exist? Do you have permissions to write for them, et cetera, et cetera, even before, you know, and we can do this as soon as possible. In some cases, that could be really trivial. So here's a very trivial example. So again, just to give you a feeling for the language. So you know, start reverse, declare all versions that you want, and then you know you're going to read from this fastq file, just a single file, and then you map it. And so here, if you don't specify anything, you, it's going to use BWA. Although you can, if you just add comma mapper equals minimap2, it would use minimap2, right? But here you you're mapping to a known reference that comes from this module, and then you're writing to this file, and so, and here the file's right there, so it's actually quite easy for, you know, it would be quite easy to replicate this in other settings where, you, you, you know, you can just check whether all of these paths are fine, and then, you know, before you even do the mapping. Uh, we actually can do a little bit better because we can, you know, we, so in, in this case, um, also trying to, so once you have many samples, one way that we've used to organize this is you sort of do an indirect where you keep a, you keep a list, you keep a file with the list of your samples, you're called samples.txt, and then, and then you, you index it by, by a job index, uh, and, and you run this multiple times and doing it even in parallel, 
and now and then you pre-process each one individually. And now here the problem is it, you need to get halfway through the script to know where the latter part of the script is going to use. Um, but here we can sort of analyze the abstract syntax tree and move those checks and try and still do those checks as early as possible. So as early as the as a, as the language knows, oh, you know, in in five steps I'm going to need to use this directory. Can already go and check. Oh, does this directory really exist? And does the directory have have uh, the right permissions, etc. So the, so a lot of this is this type of really small things, uh, but in the end, this is you know this is the, about providing a better use, user experience. Uh, so as we as we saw, I think in the previous talk, we also we can we can we annotate the we can annotate the outputs uh, we can annotate the outputs so that here uh, we we print as comments in the output or in the, this depends a little bit on exactly what the output format is. But so here, if you just have a text file, then it outputs as a text file both in a way that's nice for humans to read and also in a way that's nice for machines to read. You know, here, uh, here there's, uh, this was, there, uh, there's a couple of other tools that then can use this to check, okay, were, were these things computed in an equivalent manner, yes or no? Uh, okay, so as I said, everything is versioned. So we can use this to, uh, to evolve the language and, and the APIs uh, while keeping backwards compatibility. Uh, so, so already we have some, we have some things that work differently in version one versus the previous versions, and and um, again, again, uh, as in the previous talk, one one thing one thing we we always keep in mind is so this script should completely define the computation. So it, it's the you know from the computer from the computer science point of view, for you know the, the output is a deterministic function of what the inputs were plus the script. So and all and there's a lot of incidental information and we've we've all gotten um, we've all gotten these scripts from someone else that refer to paths in their home directory, we've all gotten scripts that refer to some something that exists in their cluster environment, and so here all of those things are really important but here we've separate them so that um, so those things are you know you can specify those in a configuration file where you're uh, and you can tweak a lot of these things. Uh, but they're not part of they're not part of the actual script that because this way you can share the script. Uh, I mean we've we've started doing it. We have now a couple of papers where we've done this where we've published alongside the paper saying this is what you used. And in principle, someone takes that, they run it with their own with their own system. But as long as they use the same data and the same script, they should get you know the exact same tables as we had. Okay, so as I said, we've recently gotten to version 1.0. Um, you know, we have, we have a, uh, a set of built-in functionality, mostly handling fast queue files, um, processing them in basic ways, doing, so we always do QC. You don't specify that you want to do QC. You don't get a choice. Any operation that modifies a file will get QC at the top and QC after, afterwards. Um, we also benefit from, you know, this is sort of done in a streaming manner so that as stuff is being read from disk, it gets QC'd in, and as it's being written back to disk, it gets QC'd out. Uh, we, you can also extend it. Uh, you know, you can always extend it just by writing code and contributing code. That's one way. Uh, um, another way is so if you're if you're just adding basically a function that takes some, you know, some inputs and produces some outputs, you can do that with a YAML file. So when we have a couple of those, a um, couple of those already. So ju just to give you an example, an example of the type. So this is a this is an actual this is an actual module that we have. It's it's called Motus from from you, from Alessio who's sitting over there. He's, he's the he's, a, he's the first author there on on this tool. And so here in this YAML file, you specify what you know th that it it's going to take a read set. It's going to so that means it's going to take a set of fast queue files. And here it says that you know their tool can handle if the files are gzipped, um, and then NGLS can can then handle all of the conversions. So if you if you give it you know if you give it a, a file that's has it's in bzip too, then this one then it will get auto converted. So all of those things are the type of things that we think the users the users shouldn't care about. They should think that conceptually I have a set of reads, uh, this tool takes a set of reads, I should be able to plug this together. Uh, and these things, and, and all of the things, uh, and so for example, one thing that this tool cannot do is cannot stream the reads. So that means that sometimes we might need to do a, to do a temporary file. But the users really shouldn't care about these things. 
And then one thing also that's important uh, is, so here at the bottom we have the citation so that, so that whenever, you, whenever you use this, we print on the command line that please we should cite Alessio's paper. Um, because that, that's actually a problem that sometimes things get integrated into bigger tools and, and sort of the identity of the, of the little parts gets lost. Uh, so at least we try, we try to support the best practice of, cite, of citing things by printing it out for, you know, and we hope that the user can at least copy paste that into their, into their paper. Um, so th oh, this is what I was saying. So, you know, best practice should version all the things. Um, rarely, rarely really follow through. It's very hard to version, because in principle you'd have to version all your stack. Uh, so here at least we tr we're trying to, you know, just version a small number of things, make it easy to cite. Quality control, we always do that. Um, and as I said, we isolate the system specific information. So we've, we've done this for, for metagenomics. Uh, so we've, we've developed a couple of pipelines uh, for different environments. So this, was, so this was not a novel approach. The approaches have been done before. We actually had a, an earlier tool called MoCat that did a lot of this. Um, and, and we just re-implemented it with NGLS. So as I said, we, didn't, we, we never want to say we should use it because it's fast. Uh, that's not the most important thing, but we're still really fast. Uh, and, and in particular, we're really fast because, so a lot of the other tools, so we tried HTSEC count as a comparison. I actually tried to use feature counts. Um, it wouldn't run even with one terabyte of memory. And that's just because these tools were done for quote unquote small things like the human genome. Whilst in metagenomics, we really have much larger data sets. So we actually scale much better to these larger things. So uh, I'm, Coming to the end, so if, again, so this is, the, the slides are open, uh, are public. So we, you can install this with Conda. Uh, it's a single command, so 11,000 people have done it, so they can't, they can't be all wrong. Uh, we have a paper that really came out last month. We have, we have what I think is very complete documentation. All the code is on GitHub, uh, and we have a mailing list. So, and, and so, to summarize, we have a domain-specific language. Uh, so here, as I said, this, there's this trade-off where we've sacrificed a lot of generality compared to, compared to other solutions, but we're trying to give the users a better experience. Uh, we've gotten to version 1.0 ju uh, just a few months ago, and, and we're focused on metagenomics. I actually know of one person in the world that has been trying to use this for RNA-seq. I think it would work. It's just a bit outside of my own and our own personal expertise. Uh, so, so with that, I want to thank thank the other collaborators, um, and also all of the users who reported bug reports. Uh, that's actually really nice. It's really helpful that you guys help with that. Um, actually, some people in the room have reported bug reports. Thank you. Praise is also really good. Um, and also, thank, thank you for everyone.